All right, I'm back. We're here again, and it is absolutely pouring rain out. So I'm going to get caught up, going to get some more voices heard as usual, not going to stop. And maybe, possibly later on today or even this evening, I'm going to get our friend Darren Clark on here, I think. He's had some recent uh, first-hand, I wouldn't say interactions, but they're letting him know they're there, and he caught it on video. So we might want to share that, and we'll find out what happened, what led up to that, how it ended, what went down during, what it felt like, what do we think was going on. I think that would be very interesting, especially coming from firsthand and recent, like just the other day, right? So I'll see if I can squeeze that in later on. Uh, tomorrow I will be having a good conversation with David Nino Rodriguez. Rodriguez. <laughs> So I always screw up in that name. I don't know why. I'll be doing that tomorrow on top of the regular voices being shared segment of these videos on this channel. What else? For the curious, I know a lot of people are on the west coast of North America, which is also where there are black-tailed deer, which I've been very passionate about hunting those. So for the hunting population here, for the viewers, I finally made the book... Um, the soft cover book is available on Amazon, all right? I'll, I'll, I think there's a link to it. There's a link to it in Sarah's How to Hunt store. And I'll possibly, if I remember, I'll put a link to this book in the description below this video. All right? And also, uh, that book is filled with color, numerous color photos. There's, I think they're close to 400 pages. So the ebook, the paper book, paperback is available. I didn't make the hardcover available because I believe I screwed up. I tried to make it so expensive to get anything done these days, especially with the color photos. So I made that book gloss pages and then went to make it with color photos. But that was back when it was double space too. And it's like, I forget what it was, 50 something freaking dollars US just to get it printed. And then I made it smaller and then I realized now where I possibly screwed up, but I need, I should have published it in color instead of black and white, and I can't go back. The only way I can publish that hardcover book in color photos, which it should be, is if I unpublish the book and start again. So, I'm not really up for that right now. So right now, we'll make sure the paperback and the ebook is live right now, and then I'll wait for a while, and then I'll redo it again to give the hardcover book glossy color photos, which would be pretty cool because there are a lot of color photos included in my stories that I share, specific big mature bucks that I singled out and stayed on, some of them for numerous years at a time. And I have lots of color photos to go with the, the stories of my journey becoming an outdoorsman, self-taught. All right, there you go. Now, who do we got, what do we got? Who is patiently waiting to be heard? This is titled Encounter Unsound. Hi, Steve. I heard you ask if anybody has experienced a lack of sound, especially near a river, during an encounter. And this encounter came to mind. All right. I don't think I asked that. I think what I did ask, I do remember asking before, as if the sound of rushing water disappears as well. That's what I'm curious about. While fishing in an area that was controlled by wardens, I decided to take a position on the bank that was hidden to avoid detection. Bracket. Poaching. and Bracket. After fishing for an hour or two, I suddenly noticed a strange atmosphere suddenly descend on the place. I was trying to understand what was causing this change. I slowly became aware of something upstream about 25 meters. There was no sound to give it away. What I noticed was a strong sense of being inside a bubble. What was in the center of this bubble was whatever was upstream on my right. I'm sure this sense of being inside a bubble was created by interference with my auditory senses. That feeling of everything going silent is, I believe, just our hearing being affected. How this occurs, I do not know. 
is it infrasound or a ground vibration? The answer to your question, yes. The sound of the river did go quiet along with everything else. That's interesting and creepy. It lasted for about a minute and then gradually that feeling was gone and the river returned to normal. I knew I was in the way, but I wasn't gonna move. Directly behind me, a branch snap confirmed to me they had bypassed me by going around. I bobbed up out of my position to see if I could see them, but there was no sign of them in the thick brush, but I'm sure they must have seen me. I had seen them previously using this river as a travel route to a place where they dined. Two of them moving fast, using the boulders like stepping stones, and then dropping down to wait for the second one to catch up, like a military maneuver. That's creepy. It was only later I realized these were the two from near my home on their travels. Hope this helps. Wow, that's a lot of missing information there, a lot of people are going to say. Sounds like you've got some ongoing experiences with these beings and they have no problem letting you know what's going down. Kind of funny, isn't it? Not funny, but odd how they single out individual human beings and let them know on a regular basis. Thanks for sending that in, man. I appreciate that share and that answering of that question, big time. Now this is titled Docile in Indiana. Hi, Mr. Steve, and hi to the club in a return. I'm 64 years old, still plugging along. I've married twice now. They both have passed on. My girlfriend and I have been together for 18 years. Between us, we have six kids and 14 grandkids. We have a really great family. If I ever see you in public, I'd step up to shake your hand. I'd look you in the eye, give you my name. That's just how I was raised. I'd be honored to shake your hand. You have true grit. Appreciate the kind words, man. I've been watching your YouTube channel for a long time. I was watching when you told your first experience and shared your grandfather's story about the forest people. I've listened to every episode. Wow. The round table of knowledge has grown. Good job, Steve. And I thank all the brave souls that have shared their stories. I feel like you helped thousands of people. Plus, there are many more people who didn't write in. Let alone all the folks that have written in, still in your folders, waiting to be heard. Steve, you are a hero. I spoke on this topic to our kids. They don't know what to think of it. Or maybe they think I'm a nutcase. They don't really like me. They don't really like for me to talk about it around the grandkids. It may scare them. But I feel it's my duty to inform them all I can while I'm still alive. That's what dads do, right? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. You mean your average kid isn't going to run into a kidnapper, right? But you're going to let them know about the strangers out there that could be bad. What's the difference? Not meaning that they're going to be kidnapped, but what's the difference in letting them know that there is some shit going on out there that you probably will come across, but you better be aware now, right? Sorry for the interruption. <laughs> this topic alone is real easy proof that our governments lie to us. But don't let me get started in about government. It won't go well. Please bear with me, though, through this email. Learning was not my favorite subject in school. Plus, I'm packing this out on a cell phone. I've been interested in Bigfoot ever since I saw Patty's video from Bob Gillen. I remember it being pretty convincing. It looked real as hell to me. And at the time, I became a believer. <laughs> I've had the urge to share my story for a couple of years. The more I learn of the forest people, the harder it is to know when my story begins. So here it goes. I was born in the boondocks of Indiana. We did move closer to town in 67. My dad was a true badass veteran from the Korean War. Me and my two brothers learned to work hard and be honest. Dad did a good job teaching us everything about firearms, construction, mechanics, and good old common sense. There was stuff I learned from my dad he didn't teach. I learned to read between the lines, pick up bits of information from being around him. Small things he would say or do. After spending so many years with him, I learned a lot. I'm one of the lucky guys that actually had a real dad. It was, ex it was especially, especially cool. You think, obviously, man, especially cool to see him man up to someone who needed it. I wish I had time to tell you some more dad stories, 
He was someone you didn't want to F with. Best dad ever. We lost him in 2000. I wish I could talk to him about all this. He would admit he would have listened to me. I turned out to be a rebel soul and the outdoorsman in the family. I was trapping by the time I was 10 or so. I started hunting after that. I kept the freezer full of white tail. Not anymore. I bought a walker coon hound and a wheat light for $100 when I was 18, then a horse. From then on, I was an avid coon hunter for years, eventually hunting off my mules and horses. Actually, I'd spent a lot of years training mules and horses to trail ride and hunt. I taught them to do shit other trainers didn't teach. I had them tied, brushed, saddled, and their feet cleaned every day. I rode almost every day or night, especially during hunting seasons. I had a jump blanket that I taught them to hike over. They don't like to let their feet hit the blanket, so when I tossed it over a log or fence, they would clear it to avoid getting caught in the wire. I had logs to jump by the barn, an easy one at first. I worked them up to the advanced log that was a three-foot diameter log, but the top of it was around five and a half feet up from the ground. I wallowed them up and down the steepest hills, the thickest brush, and the worst of weather in the middle of the night, jumping logs and fences or through mud and or deep water. You know, like how it goes on a coon hunt. Actually, I don't. <laughs> After a couple months with them, there wasn't very much to bother them. Even when you flushed a turkey out of the brush, they stayed underneath you. LOL. I enjoyed my time with them. I loved everyone I worked with. I feel like get along with animals better than people. I built me a house back in the woods. It was a perfect place to raise my kids. And coon dog puppies. Just saying all of that to let you know I have lived my life and how much time I spent in the woods, especially during hunting and mushroom seasons. In my mind, I knew Bigfoot was probably real, but in the upper northwest. Excuse me, but we ain't got them here. I would have seen one by now. I played, I paid close enough attention to tracks on trails that I've been on. Not much slips past me in the woods. I made sure of it. I've grown up doing crow calls and turkey calls. Me and an old friend that's passed on used to sit out on my deck and practice owl calls just to hear one say, Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you? What's all? <laughs> I've, been, I've been fascinated listening to the round table of knowledge. I hear all the stories, each story one by one, brought memories to my mind that I somehow forgotten. Or sometimes I just blew things off that made no sense. Several times I would have to rewind your show because what I was hearing took me back in my mind. I'd be remembering past experiences instead of listening to the story you were reading. I still had trouble getting this through my head, but these stories have patterns it has taught me. You know, after so many stories, and there have been thousands, they are too consistent from all over the world to ignore. Now there's no doubt in my mind they, the forest people, are real. Yes, they are. One time I was coon hunting, close to a large lake. On a back section, people really don't go. While skinning a coon, I heard these big ass kaplashes, kasplashes in the lake. I stopped what I was doing to see what was going on. I walked about 50 feet to the water's edge to see what it was, and the splashing stopped. There were still air bubbles floating to the surface. It was back in a cove of the lake. The other side was probably 100 feet away. I could see through the woods with my hunting light, and there was nothing out there. I've trapped beaver, and I've heard their distress warning they make with their tail. This splashing was way too big for that. More like big boulders hitting the water. I went back to skinning, and the splashing started up again. I tied my coon hide on my mule, and I rode back to the water. Then splashing stopped again. I just went on my way and I never thought of it again until I heard about this behavior on how to hunt. One time I was doing my shoot and skin routine and I started hearing growls and moans. Whatever it was, it was something that I had never heard before. It sounded somewhat close at first, then farther away like it was across the cornfield. I had two mules with me that night. My younger mule was in training. They had their heads turned and ears pointed in that direction. I just kept my eye on them because they would tell me when it was time to go if that time came. I wasn't really scared of scared or anything. The mules were a little nervous, but not in any panic. 
when I was tying my coon skin onto the young mule to carry, I heard a, a louder, close growl. It hit me that whatever it was, that there was more than one of them. I slid my crack shot 9422 Winchester back in the scabbard and stepped up in my saddle. I had my 9mm Glock pulled out of my pocket for, for enough it would be a quick grab if I needed it. Once I was on my mule, I figured wherever she went, I was going too. In case all hell broke loose, lol. I still wasn't really scared. It's just that I ain't stupid. I didn't know what it was, but it was big. There's been bear and cat sightings reported, even though they say we don't have bear or big cats around here. And I was coon hunting along Salt Creek in Brown County one night. I had my eight-year-old Grand Knight Champion with me. He was the best kill dog I ever had. He was big, strong, and always right when he treed. I sent him along the edge of the cornfield towards the creek that night. I started walking that way myself because I had confidence in him. They had only been a few minutes before he treed. But instead, he came running back out as fast as he went in and right and ran right into my legs. I tried to get him to go back to the creek to hunt, and he wouldn't. I've had old hunters tell me about times or places that their dogs won't go. I didn't believe them about that shit and thought maybe they were trying to keep me out of their favorite hunting places or something. I couldn't get my dog to hunt where we were at, so I snapped his lead on and headed back to the truck. My dog was tripping me, trying to walk between my legs. I never saw him act that way. Meanwhile, I could hear something big moving to my right, or so I thought, walking in the pasture next to the field I was in. I'd stopped to listen, but didn't hear anything. I usually had my light off while I was walking like that to save my battery. Plus, I had excellent night vision at night. I practiced that all my life. It was a dark ass night, but I could make out the cornrows. When I was walking again, I heard it again. After a few times, I flipped my light on towards the sound I was hearing, and what I saw was a pair of eyes that turned its head so I couldn't see the shine. Just like a person would do if you shined a bright light in their eyes. That's weird, I thought, but nothing was out there. It was maybe 25 yards from me, so I walked over to get a better look. I shined across. There were thin bushes in that pasture, but nothing a cow could hide behind. There was not any cow shit or hoof prints in there either. The eye shine was olive green, and the eyes were far apart like a cow. Yet when the light was off, I could still hear something walking the same time I walked. Turning on the light trick only worked the first time. My dog was getting hard to handle, and I was glad to get him back to the truck. Once again, I didn't feel any fear. I never saw it was actually there. I drove probably 10 miles to another spot and had no more trouble that night. I'll tell you about a scream I heard. I was probably 12 or 13 at the time. Me and my neighbor was riding our bikes around a field on the back side of the farm. And suddenly we heard what sounded like a woman screaming bloody murder. How many times has that been shared? That detail, the description of that sound. How many? Right? How many? And it was probably only 25 or 30 yards away in a small creek. It was loud enough to shake my insides. The scream lasted long enough for me to look around and think there is a lady that needs my help and I must help her. I didn't know a lady could scream so loud. But when the scream finally exhausted, and then I could hear a bigger than life inhale. That was the scary part. It sounded snotty and gargled. At that time, I knew it wasn't a lady. Now I sure as hell wasn't going to go stick around to help. I kind of snapped out of the state I was in. We got the F out of there. We told his dad what we heard, and he listened to our story and laughed, calling us little pussies. It was probably just a fox. They can sound like a woman. And that's the end of that story, but I know that it wasn't an effing fox. A fox ain't so loud that even it shakes the ground. Yes, that time I was totally scared. We never went back to check that area. Every day I've watched you on YouTube, the stories keep coming. It has caused me to rethink my whole life, clear back to the, my beginning. 
I was a hard kid to raise. I was sneaking out of the house at night as far back as I can remember. As far back as four years old. When I was a little older, I was allowed to camp out in the summer. Me and some neighbor kid would go as far as we could just to be far away from the house. We camp all summer until school started. We had to show up every morning to do chores, but back out about every night. By the time I was 14, I was sneaking out and sneaking the car or truck out of the driveway and ran around getting drunk. Yes, my dad kicked my ass a lot for that stupid shit I did. I've asked my older brother about the early days, but he doesn't remember some of the stuff that I do. Like once he told me he didn't like being close to the holler just to the east of our house. It was a thicket that only a rabbit would enjoy. He could sometimes hear noises in there. There was another place in the woods he didn't like because it sounded like someone was on the other side of the tall briar bushes. Also, I remember crossing the road and hiding in a bunch of sticks. I could see our whole front yard from there. I was pretending to run away. I'd sneak in there to be alone. Also, I watched our elder neighbor working his garden or pulling logs close to the house with big workhorses. I remember liking my hideout because it was like my own little fort. It's been too long for me to recall, but... But was I inside a stick structure? I don't hunt anymore after shoulder injury. I took a time out and never got started again. No horses, no mules, no coon dogs, not even chickens anymore. Just a little red healer that won't let me watch TV without playing fetch with her first. Kids got raised, doing all the fun stuff outdoors with me, up and down the creeks, setting limb lines for catfish. They enjoyed going on several trail rides with me. After my wife died in 06, I bought myself a Harley. And I like to go places that I've never been. I have a great girlfriend now for 18 years. Her kids are like mine, and mine are like hers. We give them our love. I have a fun-filled, action-packed life. Little, sorry. I have a fun-filled, action-packed life so far. I've always been good at having fun. I'm a little beat up from all that, but I would trade any of it just to be like a, like everyone else. My new hobby now is artifact hunting and napping stone tools, napping projectiles, knives, and scrapers as a talent. I like to pass on to our grandsons with primitive trapping skills. It will enhance their survival skills. With the way the world is today, it may help them. Now I'm babbling back to the topic. <laughs> I'm guilty too. I can tell you many more stories about my forest friends. That's the name I gave them. There was a lot of fighting in our house while growing up and here's a part that i normally wouldn't share i will tell you this only because i think it may be relevant but who knows and here it goes many many days i would go to the woods as a young boy to have a safe place to go and cry i felt so unloved it broke my heart and i cried out loud like a baby dad always said if he heard me quote you better not cry or you'd give me something to cry about end quote I could get all by myself and let it out, and the feeling wouldn't go away. It didn't make sense because my sorrow would turn into joy. Sometimes it came real fast. I thought nature loved me even if no one else did, and then I thought it must be God. And I still think that. Now I think that it was because the forest people helped me feel better about myself, about myself somehow. I heard about getting tagged from How to Hunt from the Owl Man, and I had to think about all of that too. I'm not out in the woods like I used to be, but the forest friends are still there. Little things happen. Like when I left the lawnmower sitting out one night because it ran out of gas at dusk. The next day, there was a blue jay feather laying on the center of the seat. There's more than that I can mention, but I can't spell out my whole life in an email. My girlfriend worked nights at a gas station for a while. I'd ride my Harley there to hang out while she was on break. So one evening, there was a little daylight left while going to see her. And I saw a two-inch rock come flying toward me from the right side of the road. It came from some trees. I was worried because it was too far away to reach me, or so I thought. It just kept coming. At that last second, I tilted my head down, and it hit me on my helmet. Perfect throw. My first thought was kids did it, but that rock flew too flat and hardly any arc and came from so far. It would have beamed me between the eyes if I hadn't ducked. Now I'm thinking it was a juvenile Sabe wanting his ass kicked. Here's a strange twist of that story. I was going to stop where it happened and look it over. I've been down this same 
row time after time and I can't pick out exactly where I was. That's out of character for me. I still have the nick on my helmet. I know it really did happen. I bet that round table of knowledge folks would understand about this kind of phenomenon, mind suppression. Okay, it's getting long, but here's this. In the spring of 22, while spending time with a grandson while his mom and dad were busy, I was throwing the ball to Nami, our red healer, behind their house. Nami jumped a, ra jumped a rabbit that went into the woods next to their house. The ball was still, still in her mouth when she took off after the rabbit. I too went to the woods to see if I could find the ball she ran off with. I didn't find the ball, but then I was checking around for possible mushroom trees. And after a bit of time, my girlfriend called me on the phone to tell me she had some food cooked up for us. It wasn't until I got off the phone that I realized my dog was not in sight and how quiet it was around me. I even made a big swallow to make sure my ears didn't need to pop. Then I said out loud, please don't hurt my dog. She's a good girl and I don't want anything to happen to her. I said it a few times, and it wasn't long, and my dog showed back up and went to the house without her ball. When she came back, I said out loud, thank you for not hurting my little dog. And then I was telling my girlfriend what happened in the woods while we were sitting on the back eating. I said it felt like someone heard me say those things. I was explaining to her about what I heard on your channel about being tagged. And how this all sounds too crazy to believe, but I was wondering if I was someone they tagged. But just after I said that, we heard a loud tree break and smash to the ground. I guess to be 75 yards away. It wasn't really even windy. It was only a calm breeze. And I said to her, that's all the confirmation I need. I reckon I'm tagged. The next time we went to their house, the ball I lost was in the yard close to the deck that we ate on that day. Lost balls have reappeared at another house we visited. It seems like they follow me around. I still go to the woods anytime I please, there's no fear here, but I have to say it's different now. It's because I know they know I know. It's a different feel. As I approach any woods, I stop and look. Then I say, I come in peace. Don't, please don't even ever scare my grandkids. Please don't hurt my dog and thank you. I hope your day is well. I give them respect. My story is long, but you said to tell it all in one email. But there's too much to say. Thanks for all I've learned from you and all the round table of knowledge. I watch the facts by how to hunt every day. I want to see how this I want to see how this story ends. At least I know the truth. If you get in my neck of the woods, you're welcome to join us. I can put you up in our camper. We have a campfire in our yard and good conversations. Trust you got to take care of Steve. Docile in Indiana. PS. I don't give a rat's ass what anybody thinks of me or my story. I don't have to prove anything to me or anybody else. I just don't want to put my name out there. All right. Well, did you share it in the beginning? I don't know. It was a long one. I'll go back. Nope. Didn't share your name. There you go. Appreciate you, appreciate the share, man. I'm glad you've learned. And I'm glad you found some comfort with all the people here. It's important things these days. But there you go. Another member chimes in. Here's another one. It's titled Dogman question mark 1958 slash 59 question mark France. Hello, Steve and all longtime listener and feel this may help someone. You never know. As I'm writing because of another video you did, Washington State on Fire. The story of the wavy haired black and white streaked hair looking gorilla. His description was like he saw what I saw. Okay. Hope I do it justice. My name is Mary Ornelas. I'm 69 now, and this is in 58 or 59. I was four or five years old. We were visiting my mom's family in France. I just had lunch, and my cousin and I wanted to go play. It's a small village named Le Orms. L-E-S-O-R-M-E-S, -E -E and it's just beautiful. It's a very old church that has a little trail to the river on one side, and the chateau grounds with a huge wall on the other side of the church. On the riverside was a turret, but I always wanted to go in and see the river from there. So my cousin was 11 years older than me. 
She was only putting up with me because she was bored, lol. But we both agreed and wanted to go see inside the turret. Went to the other side of the church and found a gate. She turned the handle and it opened. We were excited and ran to the turret. Looked at the river and figured out the turret was too creepy and full of spiders and things. We continued to walk just a bit and could see this dark black thing running toward us. As we got closer, I could see it had long, wavy black hair with white streaks of hair just flowing, maybe five inches long. Looking at the head, all I could see was a huge mouth open and long, sharp teeth. This sent me into a fear I'd never known. All I could think of was gorilla. We turned to run and my legs did not function. I kept falling, slipping on gravel and screaming my head off. If this thing was making any noise, I could hear it over my screams. I thought it was a goner when my cousin came back, grabbed me and put my and put me piggyback on her, and she ran. We had to make a left on the trail to get back to the gate we come in. And as we're almost to the gate, I turned to see it was still following. All this time, I couldn't believe it hadn't caught up with us. What I see to this day still does not make sense. But here it goes. I see its profile as it's turning the corner left to follow us. The body is still black and white flowing hair, but the head is brown. It is, it's a large dog head with barely a neck and still snarling teeth showing. Never saw the eyes. It was sauntering like it was almost skipping. Like it was having the time of its life scaring the hell out of us. Not running fast as if it was running after us. It was so strange. So as far as I was concerned, it was still coming. We get to the gate, she opens it. We're out and slam the gate shut. Laughing and crying, we wait to hear if it jumps on the gate to, the, to bark, growl or scratch, whatever, but nothing. No breathing, no sound of any kind. We cannot see through the gate and we're not going to open it. My cousin turns to me, takes my shoulders and shaking me says, You will never, 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 ever tell anyone about this. And I'm saying no, no, no. I already knew this because we're on Chateau grounds, which was a big no-no. So I can't tell even if I wanted to, lol. This cousin and I were very close due to, due to age. Oh, sorry. This cousin and I were never very close due to age. So I never felt I could bring it up to her later. It's as clear now as it, as it was while it was happening. This is the first time I've ever told this to anyone and the story has never changed except that now I know it wasn't a gorilla. Thank you for being there for us, Steve. It's given the last four years a little light and opening doors that have been closed for way too long. Wolverines with a fist <laughs> emoji. P.S. I tried to send this with pics of the village and church, but my email decided it was too much to send. After halfway through, grr. You all take care. Mi Mary... Christine, you can say it. All right, Mary, appreciate you sharing that with us. And that's a terrifying freaking experience. I don't give a shit who you are. That would scare the living crap out of anybody and everybody. Would it not? Dog-headed thing. I think I asked before. I don't think anybody from British Columbia has seen a dog-headed thing, have they? I seen. I said it before. A guy, a fisherman, said he saw something walking on all fours. That was over the hood of his uh, pickup truck in the night. Northern British Columbia, northwestern British Columbia. That's about it so far. I have no curiosity to see one of those things myself. But if I have to, I guess I'll have to deal, right? I want to hear from Bobby Short some more, and I'm going to, and I'm going to share her with you. She deserves that, deserves to be heard, deserves respect. Fort Lewis, Washington, U.S. military installation, 77 and 78. In 78, Edwin Godoy, Godoy, G-O-D-O-Y, was an E-4 soldier with the U.S. Army commissioned to Fort Lewis in Washington State. Fort Lewis is located next to a forested area in, the western, in that western state. Mr. Godoy 
was also an expert marksman who came out as the third best marksman in the U.S. Army for that year. One night, as his platoon was returning in a truck for some war games, from some war games in the forest, the truck malfunctioned and lost all power. Impossible to make it start, the acting commander decided to return to the base by foot with the soldiers and ordered Godoy, as he was the one who had signed for taking out the truck, to stay and guard it until morning, when a tow unit from the base would be sent to pick him up with the vehicle. <laughs> That's an odd thing to guard, right? Go, go guard that vehicle. It doesn't run, but we don't want anybody carrying it away. <laughs> right? To Godoy, this was somewhat irregular, as normally two men would be ordered to do this. Anyway, the others left at about 8 p.m., and he remained there with the truck. At about 12.15 a.m., he noticed a figure some 300 meters away from him, standing next to some pine trees in the forest. But what shocked Godoy was the size of the figure. It was very tall, and it was its body was completely covered with hair. Quote, it was something very big, huge, a giant, end quote, he said. And it was all covered by dark, long, grayish hair all over its body. He was standing next to a pine tree and swinging his body sideways while looking straight at me. It looked somewhat like a man, but it wasn't a man. Very strongly built, with a broad chest. The eyes seemed to be self-luminous and glowed red. The thing started coming towards me, so I shouted a halt three times, asking the thing to stop and identify itself. As it wouldn't reply, I made the first shot to the air, and then I shot at him, or it. I don't know how to call it. The hairy thing grabbed its chest and emitted a loud moan, stopped, and then ran to his right, disappearing into the heavily tree forest that makes up Fort Lewis Army Base. Got away. Very nervous, reasoned, he had just seen a Bigfoot, one of the forest creatures the North Americans in the region often talked about. Afraid, he locked himself inside the truck until 6 a.m., when two mechanics from the base arrived in a tow unit to pick up the truck. He explained what had happened, but they didn't believe him. They all went to where the hairy thing was shot, and the men are surprised to see huge human-like footprints imprinted in the soft ground, and several small pools of blood that looked red, but strangely oily and fresh looking. The mechanics stared at each other and then looked at Godoy in a strange way and mumbled something between them in a low voice. From that moment on, they kept a distance and wouldn't talk to him. They communicated by radio to the base and reported the incident. Later on, the truck started at first try. At about 7.30 a.m., some unknown personnel arrived to the site. Several men dressed in white lab coats wearing thick gray rubber, uh, bracket leaded, question mark, bracket, gloves and boots took samples from the tracks impression on the ground. The alleged blood, which was handled with extreme care, the mechanics talked with these men, but Godoy was not allowed to do the same. Later, they were all ordered by radio to return at once to Fort Lewis. Godoy was to report himself to the base hospital immediately at his arrival. Alarming. To his surprise, an Air Force medical officer and a colonel were waiting for him there. Fort Lewis is a U.S. military base with no ties with the Air Force, so why the presence of this full-bird Air Force colonel there? He couldn't say. The usual thing would have been for the regular medical staff in the base hospital to attend him. This man was not from the hospital's medical staff. The officer debriefed him thoroughly on the incident and made a complete medical and physical exam on him. While examining him, the officer kept asking at what distance at what distance he was from the creature when he shot at it. He was asked the creature's description and asked if he felt a tingling, sen tingling sensation or had a sore throat, headaches, if a rash had, had developed on his skin and other things. The Air Force medical officer apparently knew what to ask. It was obvious to Godoy 
that he was looking for specific symptoms and answers, but symptoms and answers to what? Several samples of his blood, skin, scrapings, urine, saliva, and other types of samples were taken from Godoy. The soldier knew something odd was going on. He kept asking the officer where he had come from, but he wouldn't answer. After being examined, he was ordered to go to his barracks where he took a shower and rested. Later, he was ordered to go to the base commander's office. The base commander, a lieutenant general named, name not remembered by Ed Godoy, was there together with his company commander, Captain Underwood, and a colonel whose last name was, to his best recall, Cropsey, K-R-O-P-S-I-E. They debriefed him again on what happened out in the woods, and then the base commander ordered Godoy to not talk ever to anyone on what had happened. He was warned that if he ever talked about it, he'd be court-martialed or would have to face the consequences. Hmm. Later, heading to his room, he is approached by L. Robles, R-O-B-L-E-S, a Puerto Rican soldier. Okay, means Roble, Robles, <laughs> whatever. A Puerto Rican soldier who was assigned in hospitals in the hospital's lab. We'll call him Roble. <laughs> Roble asked Godoy what it was he had shot. Godoy said, Godoy said he was ordered not to discuss the matter, and Roble. Roble insisted on asking. He asked Roble why it was so important for him to know. Roble answered, I, together with two other guys, had to analyze the blood samples taken from the ground. We know you're the soldier involved because it was stated as such in the report. It's crazy, but what the hell was it you shot at out there? When he examined the blood samples, we found out three weird things in it. The blood contained human blood cells animal blood cells, and chlorophyll. What the hell was it? Hmm. Godoy stated he could not disclose the incident and left. Now thinking back, he feels that the base commander, Colonel Cropsey, and Captain Underwood all seemed to know what they were dealing with. And for that reason, they had ordered him to keep his mouth shut but he found it rather strange that he was ordered to stand guard in the truck alone. Why was he left alone? I don't know, Martin, but after thinking it over, I had a strange feeling. All I know for sure is that the U.S. government and the military know something weird is happening in the Northwest, and they don't want the people to know about it, stated Godaway. And there you go. Story source, Robert Stansberry via George Martin, a researcher in Puerto Rico who met Mr. Edwin Godoy and his wife Myrna in Cabo Rojo. R-O-J-O. I, I know I probably pronounced it wrong. <laughs> in the southwest region of Puerto Rico while scuba diving. Posted to the IVBC for September 1998. Bob Stransberry has been around big footing as long as I have and is considered a qualified investigator. I personally think the base of the story is true, but the Puerto Rican phlebotomy technician's testimony is suspect, perhaps embellished. And there you go. There's another one. Actually, here's one more little quick follow-up. McGuire, AFB, and Fort Dix Army Base. A letter and possibly related story from Craig Bennett, Pemberton, New Jersey. Quote, Dear Miss Short, I've never seen a Bigfoot, found any tracks, or heard any sounds. Recently discovered your website and thought out of curiosity to just take a look. The accounts by military personnel are interesting. The point is this. Back in December 77, so 36 years ago, I was a freshman at Burlington County College, located in Pemberton, New Jersey. Next door is McGuire Air Force Base and Fort Dix Army Base. So it's a common sight seeing military personnel in college courses. While sitting in the snack bar and trying out my first cup of coffee, a soldier walked in and went over to the table, and then a second soldier arrived and went over to the first one and excitedly asked him if he had heard about the news. He related that a plot platoon of soldiers on an excursion from, I'm not sure the fort name, went into the woods to drill and were injured in an encounter with a Bigfoot somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. 
The first soldier then looked around the room nervously, and the other soldier... Sorry. And then the other soldier and told him to not talk about it here. And we'll do it later. I don't see them again, nor what I know of their names. Also, I really don't look either because I was trying to pass my courses and experience college. Craig Bennett. If there's someone with information on base encounter with Bigfoot where injuries are, are observed, please contact me. It's endless. It's a big book, right? A lot in there to be heard. And there you go. There you go. Oh, Bobby Short. She did a lot of digging and looking and researching, didn't she? She has got acres and acres and acres of first-hand testimony from how many people? You know, about that being that doesn't exist, the big folklore thing. <laughs> anyway, that should do for now, I think. Now I'm going to go get a few other things taken care of this afternoon and uh, hopefully maybe possibly maybe be able to get Darren on here see how that goes and uh, keep this ball rolling all right and also I was going through yeah I won't even say it I got a lot I got a lot coming up I got a lot coming up share my story at howtohunt.com all right that's where you're gonna get it heard word for word no matter what no matter what that's it for the sharing of the emails and stories. A quick note. I want you guys to think about this one. I've been doing, I do a lot of thinking all the time, right? And I know... I always try to look at the source of what the hell's going on and what's going wrong with anything. Because I'm just a natural fix-it-myself type of person. But one thing that I noticed that I'd come up with today, possibly this morning or last night, whatever it was, was, you know, on mainstream outlets of anything social media tv radio whatever all through school what are we taught that success is it's about making money right we are taught that being successful is making more money as i'm getting to the stage of my life and the un and the knowledge that I've been gathering for myself. It's almost like that one little lessons is pounded into all of the people since a very young age until all, for all through our lives is possibly the absolute wrong thing to be pounding into society. Don't you think? Now, this is actually going, you know, from going from the absolute shit show to trying to narrow it down, narrow it down, narrow it down, and narrow it right down to a fine tip of where everything started going wrong. Because right now, from what I've learned and from what I'm watching, the pursuit of what society has been conditioned to think is success, which is making money, seems to be possibly ground zero for the beginning of a large shit show. Are you following me? Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Think about that one for a little bit, all right? Think about that one. Because I'll tell you what, I've met and I've known a lot of people with a lot of money. And I definitely haven't met too many of those people that are happy. That's for certain. For sure. That was an early, early lesson for me in life. That if it's a doll you're chasing, you've already lost. But I'm trying to figure out what's the source what is the source of all the grief we're having? So I can try to think of some kind of a recipe to help turn it around. And so far, it seems to be suspect, right? That's the one main common denominator society's been had drilled into us is trying to make money. Become a millionaire. You want to be financially free? Making money. You know what I mean? It's the wrong. I'm learning now that it's possibly the absolute wrong message to get out to society. That's not what success is. But let's just say you felt that you would benefit from making a shit pile of money off of people. What are you going to teach them to make that recipe work true for you? You're going to get a complete whole society to believe that making more money is the true root of success. Then you are going to benefit like a mofo off of that in the end. If you're up there and evil. 
right? Picking up what I'm putting down yet? <laughs> anyway, there you go. Sometimes I think out loud too soon. My brain doesn't mesh up my lips smoothly, but I'm pretty sure that that message to our children, to society about making more money is a real bad message. The outcome, I think, is starting to show up in our faces today on a large scale, and it's not good, right? There you go. Imagine if we are if we had it pounded into us from day one that to be successful means that you helped as many people as you could in this lifetime. End of story. Anyway. Excuse me, I'll stop babbling. I'll be back later.